news item. Listen to this news item. This is a guy I got to admire. Charles Bernard is a lover of fine food. This is a note from Grenoble, France. You know Grenoble? It's a great city. In fact, Grenoble is, uh, well, that's not only the place where they had the Olympics. It's the place where, speaking of guys that hated their hometown, did you ever hear the writer Stendhal? S-T-E-N-D-A. L or D-A-H-L, depending on whether you prefer the H or the A, is Stendhal. Some people call it Stendhal. Henri Bale, his name is B-E-Y-L-E. His whole life was in getting the hell out of his hometown. He hated it. It was Grenoble, France, by the way. And his old man was a grocer. <laughs> so for that reason, he became very elegant. Walk up and down the, the, uh, the boulevards of Paris and uh, speak only of uh, the more elegant uh, side of life. And uh, he was always going to salons, and he became a superb cop. He would have been an unbelievable star on talk shows today. In fact, they say that he died the way he wanted to die, walking right down the middle of the boulevard in full tick, wearing his uh, beaver hat, and in the middle of a very long, involved conversation about the poems of a lesser-known French Impressionist. He died right in the middle of that conversation. And uh, what he hid from his friends and neighbors was that he was uh, the son of a grocer from Grenoble, France. <laughs> and he hated it. But uh, this is a note from Grenoble. Charles Bernard, a lover of fine food, sat down in Grenoble's best restaurant, the Sweet A Bordeaux. Oh, elegant. He ordered a crab salad, baked shrimp, with a cheese sauce, lamb chops, a very fine and exquisitely uh, beautifully bottled Beaujolais. He had chocolate mousse, uh, coffee, cognac, and uh, followed it up with a package of Gitan cigarettes. He also then bought a bottle of champagne for some nice Swiss tourists who were sitting at the next table. Oh, what an elegant app. You know, in a French restaurant like that, if you ever go into one of these, you have about nine stars after them, you know, in the, in the Michelin Guide. And you go there and you start... First of all, you have to call them seven weeks in advance. You don't just uh, go there and say, hey, I want to buy the eat, you know, Henri. No way. And uh, they prepare eat, and you arrive about 11 in the morning, and uh, by maybe three or four, you may be served your uh, appetizer, or possibly your pate, and by eight or nine o'clock that night, the entree comes, and after that, it's maybe till midnight before the champagne and cigars. But nevertheless, uh, Bernard... Uh, was sitting there enjoying a fine and uh, a superb meal in this elegantly rated restaurant when the waiter brought the check for 149 francs. At which point, Bernard says, Excuse him, what? I have no money. You must call the police. <laughs> Dramatic moment. <laughs> uh, so, Monsieur Bernard went to the Bastille yesterday for the 40th time for enjoying gourmet meals and never paying for them, police said today. He goes all over France, orders gourmet meals, and simply does not pay. Uh, the gourmet, who is an ex-member of the Foreign Legion, oh, that's elegant, he's a Foreign Legion member, uh, living on a small pension, is also the holder of the Croix de Guerre, and is a man of great taste and elegance. His mother, he says, was a great cook. He cannot resist a good meal and cannot subsist on second-rate food. And so he travels around the country eating at the best restaurants and then spending the next two weeks in jail. Bernard told police he planned to write now a food guide on French jails. Since he has been in over 35 of them, he says, however, the worst meals are the jails of Envillon. He says, do not go to them jails unless pressed completely to the wall. I find that elegant. And if you'd like to live that kind of elegant uh, life uh, out there in Queens, I would suggest you try the same wine that Monsieur Bernard enjoys after his meals. Alexis Lachine Beaujolais, an elegant French wine, light, crisp, fruity, as he says, with a somewhat, uh, uh, a somewhat aggressive bouquet, but nevertheless uh, pleasingly plump around the edges. Your little song. Alexis Lachine. Chanson. Alexis Oh, uh, thank you. I'm Mary Mercy. You know, I, I, I kind of like the way that guy lives. 
You know, he sounds. You know who he sounds like to me? Who who could play that beautifully? Uh, would be the late Clifton Webb. You remember Clifton Webb, the actor? I could just see him with a French accent arriving, a little bit frayed around the edges, wearing the wearing the French foreign, a little rosette of the French foreign legion there, ordering it out. And I like the touch of ordering champagne for the people at the next table. Now that that is truly style for that nice Swiss couple at the next table. And then when the waiter comes, <laughs> you must take me to jail. I cannot pay. Notice he does not say, take me to the kitchen. I will wash the dishes. No way. He says, I go to jail. I like the idea of writing a, a food guide to the various jails, too. As the food in the jails and environ are incredible. Ah, bah, humbug. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of, uh, of uh, great uh, stars, have you ever have you ever had that that terrible? You know, I once had a, a thing like that. Have you ever gone into a restaurant and and thought everything was on uh, you know under control? An expensive restaurant. Oh God, I'll never. I I I know I've never told you this story because because it just hit me when when hearing the story of this guy Charles Bernard. But I had a fantastic thing happen to me here. Some let's put it this way. Uh, at a very crucial period in my career. And I have never, I don't even, if there's some stories you don't even like to tell yourself, you know, <laughs> that's so terrible. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those bad moments, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll lay it out to you. I had a moment in a restaurant here in New York one night, which will go down in my personal lexicon of memories as being one of the, one of the worst nightmares I've ever lived through. Now, you know, it, it, you, you, we've all had nightmares, actual sleeping nightmares in your sleep. You ever have a nightmare? Uh, and they can, they can be all kinds of things, nightmares. When you try to describe a nightmare to somebody afterwards, it always sounds so flat. You know, there was this thing, oh, the thing, I had the, you know, foot sticking out of it. The guy says, oh, my God, get out of here. What's so serious? But somehow the fear in a nightmare cannot be described uh, outside of uh, your own experience. It's, it's your thing, you know. Uh, and and uh, you know, no way for you to tell a nightmare to anybody. And so for that reason, very few people talk about nightmares to other people. Because whenever, you know, you wake up, ah! <laughs> and, they're, ah! <laughs> and they're pouring water on your head and they drag you out of the sack. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> they say, what's the matter, friend? <laughs> oh, what a, oh, what a, oh, fantastic nightmare. Oh, 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 oh. Well, what happened? What did you dream of? <laughs> well, uh, there was, uh, uh, there was this telephone and, uh, 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 no way. It just simply never comes across. <laughs> But at the time, oh my God! I mean, you know, you know uh, what I mean. You ever have them, Jerry? You ever have a nightmare? Okay. Have you ever tried to explain it to anybody afterwards? It never works. But by God, you know you were scared out of your skull. Okay. And it was all. And it can be almost anything. I don't think nightmares are basically uh, fears of monsters. Now this is a. Uh, bad writers always have a guy dreaming of a monster coming, some fantastic thing. Uh, come. No way. Uh, nightmares are far more subtle than that. Much more subtle. And uh, we know it when we're living in one. And uh, I, I'll, I'm going to tell you about a nightmare experience. It was really a nightmare experience. It really was. I mean, the, put yourself in my position. You have to do it. Then I was uh, I was looking for a job. See, ever 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 ever, you know, gone through that that period of looking for, and it was desperate. I had to have a job, man. I mean, it was one of those scenes where where uh, you know everything was. Uh, I mean, it was, it was uh, the the wolves were howling, and uh, they uh, was nipping. At, and and other people I knew, I'd see guys on the street. And they were all working. They had all these things going. And, uh, oh God, I really was really was you know. Boy, had to have a job. So I got to know, uh, just by phone calls and friends, a very tenuous acquaintance who was in a position to give me a really fantastic job. And it was a girl. Now, have you ever had that happen to you? 
and I might say an attractive girl. Now, this, this presented certain problems. Now, if it's a, if you know, if it's a male, you just go in, you know, try to, uh, try to get the norm or something, talk them into it, but let them, you know, have an interview and all that. But this was different. So one thing led to the next, and one night I had arranged a date with this girl, an actual date. Now remember, she's a powerful executive, an elegant girl. And on top of it, she had the world by the you-know-what. And there I was, living from hand to mouth. I didn't know whether I could pay the rent next week, and I was living in this two-bit hotel over on 49th Street off of Times Square. In fact, this hotel was so shoddy, I've often talked about this hotel. Have you ever lived in a true flea bag over a long period of time, maybe a month, two months, a year? Well, the, the, the flea bag life is a very special life. I'm not talking about a flop house. I'm talking about a flea bag. I'm talking about the kind of hotel where where guys who used to be, uh, uh, you know, two-bit agents that handle seal acts are living, and that, you know, that kind of stuff. And here I am, I'm in this crummy little hotel, and, I, and, and I'm having problems with the rent and everything else, but I've got a date. So I did everything I could. You know, I, I, I sent the one suit that I had. I got it all clean on. I got my shirt clean and the whole bit, so... She had, this girl had no idea, remember, of my, of my plight. No way. That's part of the nightmare scene that was developing. Nightmares have all kinds of ramifications that do not come to the surface immediately. And so that night, we met. Now, I, I, I had to work it out so I, I didn't meet her with a cab or anything like that. See, she, her office was in Midtown, so I said, uh, I'll meet you at such and such a bar which I knew I could get to by walking. <laughs> so uh, we met at this elegant bar, see. And uh, every, every cent is, is, is very carefully calculated in my mind. See. And I know exactly how much money I've got. And so we both had these martinis. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I can see the meter to mine is clicking off the taxi fare of existence is ticking away. And that little sign is going tick, 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 and the numbers are coming up. We finish our, our martini, and I said, uh, well, uh, uh, really looking forward to this tonight. And she said, so am I. I said, uh, I've heard about you, you know. Really, you're a legend. She said, oh, no, no, I'm just like any other girl when I get out of the office. I said, hi, <laughs> George. <laughs> and I'm playing it very cool. So we go down the street to this restaurant. Very expensive restaurant. But it had to be. You see the situation. So we walk into the restaurant. It's dark. It's sort of a gloomy restaurant. Like all east side tryst restaurants are. You know, certain restaurants on the east side of New York, if you do not live in the city, are built entirely for romantic trysts. They have nothing to do with real food. Uh, they have prices that go with real food, but real food they do not need, because when one is having an, a romantic tryst, one does not concern oneself over the food. One concerns oneself over the, the lighting, whether the lighting is just right, whether the waiter comes with the proper subservience, treats you with the proper elan, style, and spirit. And it's a very subtle thing. New York has these fantastic tryst restaurants. There is an area of New York, by the way, which is called, to those of us who are truly in the know, Tristville. You know, like Yorkville, like Brooklyn, like Bronx, like Rosedale. There's a place called Tristville. And it's bounded right in that, it's right in that area there in the 50s. And, and uh, the east side of New York, it's on the east side of, of, of Madison Avenue. Right in that area. Every one of those little restaurants with those green things coming out over the sidewalk that have those cute little names, you know, those little itsy pool French names. You know, names like, uh, uh, like, uh, Genet's, Mario's, Trey Elegant, Apicuri, you know, and all those little names that are little feathers all around the letters and stuff. And you go in there and, uh, you're in the middle of Tristville. 
and you better be prepared to pay for it. Tristville does not come cheap in this world. I mean, because you're buying many things. You're buying, you're buying discretion for one thing. Now, you're buying a waiter who, no matter how many times you've been into this restaurant with various other women, never recognizes the fact you had. You could have been in there an hour before. But he does not say, hey, what happened to the redhead? No way. It does not happen. Although, on the other hand, he treats you as if you are an old habitué of that, which is important. Matka, ah, good to see you again, sir. And you say, ah, Louis, knowing full well that his name could very well be Henri, it could be Fred. But uh, you call him Louis. He says, ah, it's a good, uh, of course, the regular. And you say, ah, it's a très élégant, it's a pâté. And he brings it in. And everything goes swimmingly. So I'm sitting there with this girl. And we're really, you know, it's really beginning to work out. And I'm, I'm slowly maneuvering it around to, uh, well, let's put it this way. There's two kinds of tryst. There is the romantic sexual tryst, and then there's the business tryst. Both have their uh, dangers, both have their climaxes. And I was working around to the, uh, the, the meat of the evening, which was, how the hell am I going to get a job out of you? You know? And this is very subtle. This is even far subtler than the, than the sexual tryst, which is always implied. So we're sitting there. And everything is going fine. We have the filet of sole amandine, I recall. Uh, we also had, uh, along with it, an escargot. We had uh, a few little, uh, um, uh, an, an elegant watercress salad with, uh, with a fine uh, French uh, tarragon vinegar. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the finest uh, subtle sauces I've had in years. And everything is going so fine. She's mellowing. Now she's moved around. We're in one of these horseshoe boots, you know. She's sort of moved around. See, she's sitting over around with me now. No longer is she sitting across the table, and we are tinkling our glasses back and forth. We have had our second bottle of uh, of what we will say Beaujolais. And uh, she she turns to me and says, uh, uh, "Excuse me, man, please." And uh, she gets up and disappears into the darkness. Now, just before that had happened, the waiter had come in to the conversation and with his little silver platter, his little silver plate, had laid down next to the wine bottle the bad news. Well, of course, if you go to this kind of restaurant, they do not itemize it. It isn't, it isn't like going to the chock full of nuts or McDonald's. Uh, there's just a few little scrawls in purple ink and at the bottom an elegant uh, European writing, you know, the sevens with the little lines through them and all that. Uh, there is the there is the bill. Well, I I have been expecting this, right? So I look at this bill and I say, uh -huh. ah, we've done it, Chef. You've done it again, yes, sir. Real good. And I'm sitting back there and I I this is at the moment it happened. I reach in the back pocket of my suit, which has just been cleaned, and I take out my wallet and I open my wallet. No money. My wallet is empty. Empty, I said. Empty. Yes, I see. My wallet is empty. What do I do now? And she comes back and sits down. I am sitting in a restaurant with a $47 bill before me with a very important date, and not a damn cent. I have no idea where it went. That is the stuff of which nightmares are made. Sitting. But she's jabbering on, you know. She's her eyes are shining bright with the two bottles of wine and the martini and the elegant fillet of sole amandine. And she sits down next to me. 
And the waiter, I can see, is hovering as a background. He's waiting for me to put the, you know, the green stuff down on the, on the little silver tray. He goes and say, thank you, monsieur, and he will disappear and come back with the change. What the hell am I going to do? I can think of only one thing. Run! Get the hell out of here! Run! At which point, I said to the girl, I said, uh, no way. Excuse me, Myrtle. Uh, I have to make a phone call. I'll be right back. And so I got up and I walked into this dark cave of the restaurant, so heading towards the men's room. Well, the men's room was off to one side. So as I walked up close to the men's room, I see the waiter, Louis, and I said, "Where is the telephone, Louis?" He saw it up by the uh, up in the front by the desk over by the hat check girl. I said, "Thank you, Louis." At which point I go up and I pretend I'm making a phone call. I watch him through the glass. I see him turn and go to another table. At which point, zap, I'm out on the street. Out on the street. And I am running like hell. Oh my God. What am I going to do? Well... I mean, it was, it was, this was a crisis, man. This was a crisis, the worst kind. So I ran down the street. I get over on Madison Avenue, and I turn left on Madison and start running downtown. Running like hell. The only thing I can think of is to head towards my room. I figured I must have left the money on my, on my bureau or something. So I run into the hotel. I'm running, I'm out of breath. <laughs> I run 19 blocks. I go up the elevator. Not, no money. I'm broke. Oh, my God, what do I do? What do I do now? So I go down to the desk clerk, who was a poetic type, who was a poetic type, who forever claimed he was writing a novel. I said, hey. I said, Marty, oh, God, am I in trouble. Listen to the story. I said, i got to hit right now. i got to hit 55 bucks now, right this minute, now. Don't ask any questions. Give it to me. I said, yeah, okay. He reached in his drawer and he gave me 55 bags. He gave me $20 bills, a couple of tens and a five. I said, thanks, thanks. I grabbed it and ran out. <laughs> Down the street I ran. <laughs> I ran it through the door. <laughs> I swear, I've been out. The whole thing has taken me 12 minutes. 117 blocks. I must have broken all existing records for the five-mile run. I go into John. I'm getting my breath back. Oh, God. Shh. I burn the water. I put it on my face. And then I walk out. I go back to the booth. I say, huh. Oh. Sorry, I, I was on the phone, uh, Myrtle. <laughs> uh, we might as well pay the bill. Sit down. Louis, uh, we, uh, Louis, please, I uh, have, uh, here, here's the, the check, please. And he came over and he says, uh, uh, merci. I said, uh, keep the change, Louis, keeps the change. And he looks at it, six dollar, six dollar tip. He says, uh, hold. Uh, thank you, merci. Merci. <laughs> Let's see, we went out into the night. I said, you know, it's been a real nice, real nice evening, Myrtle. <laughs> really has. I'd, I'd love to go out and have a drink with you now, later, but uh, I've uh, got some work I'm working on, and I've got to get back to the, got to get back to the, uh, my suite at the hotel. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll be calling you later in the week. And she says, it's been a very romantic evening. It certainly has. A wonderful meal. And I said, oh, it's nothing, Myrtle, any time. I just uh, wish I could go out a little. I'd love to go out and make the town this night, but I just, just can't quite do it. Uh, uh, you know, busy and all that sort of thing. So I understand. I have those nights like that. She says, call me, will you? I said, I will. And she went her way, and I went mine. I could feel the sweat running down my back between my shoulder blades. 
the things of which true nightmares are made. Oh, by the way, I never got the job. Never could get through her uh, receptionist after that. But I have never forgotten that moment. And Louis here, from time to time, I go in that restaurant. And that Louis is still there. He's still making $700,000 a year. On tips alone. Not including his $14 a week salary.